Hello, and welcome to I'll Try That, the beer review and news podcast. Jack, please can I have another lager out of the fridge? I'll Try That, the beer review and news podcast. Here in London. Ding dong. I was thinking about this last night in bed. Smashed it. <laughs> Proof for success. There's a soon to be fur daddy. <laughs> Another one in the bag. I'm vetoing that. <laughs> this week, we're going to head to the land of kangaroos and koalas. But first, the hop topic. Hop topic. Hop topic. Right, so for this week's hop topic, we've had a question from a listener come in. So Max has asked, Good afternoon, gentlemen, and Joe. I'm not sure why that was spoken about there. I'm glad he has decided we are the gentleman and you are not Joe, which I'm... Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't get the gentleman no, title. I'm on it. board. Okay. I'm enjoying the podcast and learning all about these different beers. There's just one question that has arisen for me. I've heard you talk about the stigma of lagers being, in quotation marks, dirty or somehow inferior. I grew up in Switzerland and have never heard of this. Our beer culture is more like the German one, including the German brewing purity laws. Are there historically more bad beers in the UK? Are the brewing laws less stringent? Cheers, Max. So, Max, I think that's a really good question. And thank you very much for, A, writing in. That's fantastic. We will obviously field as many of these questions if uh, any other listeners and questions come, arise. Please do uh, email us at I'll try that podcast at gmail.com and we'll be sure to read them out and, and answer them on the pod. So, first and foremost... I mean, we know that the, you know, you're referring to the German purity laws. So these are a bunch of laws that came in in 2016, which basically, if from what I can read from the, you know, the kind of the crib sheets of what those laws actually did, it seems like they're actually hindering some of the craft beer or kind of put some rules and regulations around the, the new en- entrant into this market, but creating a new barrier for entry for beer companies coming into the, into the market, almost kind of protecting the established companies. Uh, breweries in in Germany and and Switzerland for me I know you're saying obviously that inhibits this kind of new age of beer but in a way I can kind of be devil's advocate and say maybe they're you know they're putting these rules in almost to keep like the heritage and the history of the beer kind of alive in that way yeah I absolutely and I think that's what the, the regulations are doing I mean Rich, when was the last time rules or regulations in the UK were put in force for, for beer? So from what I could find, the beer regulations of 1993, which was set, the document I was not going to read because it is far too long uh, with all of the bits and bobs. I have other things to do. But yeah, that seems to have a list of state of laws. <laughs> Say that last bit again. It seems to be a list of laws and policies and procedures that you have to follow, which is the same with any food product across across the board there is a certain standard that it has to adhere to so one it's not going to affect the public and it's going to there's going to be a clear quality standard that british products are going to have i think where we're getting from this uh, kind of dirty or inferior view of lager it's not really about the quality of the product because there are rules and regulations in the uk like we, there are in germany to kind of keep the quality right and protect consumers i think it really has to be about how those lagers are positioned so when we're talking about positioning, we're talking about the price points, you know, what, like, what's the value of that product? Uh, who is targeted about that product as well? So who are the drinkers? And, you know, what's been, and what's kind of, what do people feel and think about that product? And I think it's worth mentioning now that the first and second highest selling lagers or beer in the UK, Carling at number one and Foster's at number two. And both of which are lagers. And both of which are lagers. Now, when you look at those beers, they advertise and sell to kind of the footballing kind of atmosphere. They're selling at the cheaper selling point. And that's why there's been potentially more negative connotations around it, I think. It always goes down to you you hear hear the term lager lout. Which is in in if for those of you who have never heard that phrase before, it's basically just describing somebody who they 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 drink beer, they can be quite aggressive, they're not very productive, maybe members of society and stuff like that, which is a which is where the connotation is coming from. Yeah, it's a very derogative term, obviously. I mean, I think also as well thinking about the UK culture as a beer culture as a whole, like we have, you know. Lager is, has its place, you know, as we've kind of like slightly alluded to there of, you know, the kind of people who predominantly who drink these beers as well. I am one of them. I do have drunk a lot of the Carlings and the, and the Fosters as well. So I'm not excluding myself from that category. But the price point, price driven, 
you know, when you're drinking those per- those those beers. But in the UK as a whole, we have other beers like ales, for example, which, you know, I think... I mean, Simo, you were, I think, explaining that when you went into pubs when you were first starting to drink, it was almost seen as like an expectation that you didn't drink lager. Yeah, so for me, it was kind of, it was almost, it sounds bad, but it was almost like a snobbery. Like you go in, you'd be like, oh, I'll, I'll have an ale because I am I am of that ilk. It, it sounds stupid to say that when you're thinking about it now, but it, it was almost like if there's ale there, you don't buy a la- you don't buy the lager. The lager is there almost as if as like a last resort, as in like you wouldn't have that. Both are, you know, we know that as we're growing up as well, like ales were seen as, but ale also as well as a more acquired taste, almost. You know, like you would probably start off by drinking lager. That might be your, one of your first beers. Entrance to beer would yeah. be a lager, and then you would try ale. So I think it's that you're upgrading. In, even though you're not, like, because the price yeah. point's probably about the same, and you know the quality of the product is, as we said, about the same. But your your journey through beer is you're seeing it as like an upgrade to go from lager to ale. If you look at cars, it's as if it's like you're buying a Corsa and then you're upgrading to I don't know a Porsche as you go up them. Yeah, I'd say as well. I'd say it's like uh, like lager is the commodity in the UK, as we as we can see from Carling and Foster's being the one and two number sold volume of beer in the UK. It's the commodity. It's available everywhere. You know, there's nothing too special about it, but everyone does drink it. I mean, Camden did a great job of saying everyone drinks it. Let's not be ashamed with the fact that lager is a popular drink. But I think it then goes back to that's why the perception is it's everywhere. It's a commodity. It's nothing really special about it. So I think that's just, and that's very pertinent to the UK, but it's also shared with the US as well. And I think it's also, unfortunately to lager, it was linked with binge drinking and it's been linked with hooliganism in our culture as well. And I think sadly that is, it's got that link that it's trying, like people like Camden Town are trying to take away from. They're saying like, it's not a binge drinking uh, alcohol. It can be tasting, it can be nice. People have got an ethos in the UK with lager that it is, you drink it to get smashed. And I think that, unfortunately, is the attitude around it that companies now are trying to get rid of. Plus, I'd say there's a big piece of the puzzle that's missing for us here in the UK, which the likes of Germany, Belgium, Switzerland have, which is their investment into and the history around pilsners. You know, how important pilsners are. And pilsners is just a very close cousin to lagers. We don't in the UK really have that pilsner piece so when you're thinking about an ambery liquid that's you know in that kind of lager pilsner camp we just go straight to to lager whereas in switzerland and germany as i was saying you know they have pilsner there which is a very high quality and very prestigious product it's like we're we're not in the uk having that kind of connection that you can have a liquid that's a commodity and be very very well crafted Whereas in Germany and Switzerland, the likes, you have Pilsner, which is very well crafted and it is the commodity. So, Max, I hope that answers or gives some sort of insight into why from the UK we have this kind of different view of lager, I suppose. We covered quite a lot there, but I think that's hopefully given a bit of insight. And keep the questions coming in. Pursuit of hoppiness. All right, guys. So we want to talk about Foster's. Now, I know Foster's from sat here in the UK as being the quintessential Australian beer. Oh, it's, quintessential word of the day. It's got, it's just, it just screams Australia to me from how it looks. It's like kind of like golden, you know, it's got kind of got the colours of Australia in it, in, emblazoned in the, in the kind of the branding, but also all the adverts that I've ever seen as like, it's Aussie blokes, it's all about Australia and it's just like, I mean, what was the one that they had not that long ago where it's like an Australian helpline and they said this catchphrase when they picked up the phone? Their thing is, for all their adverts at the end, it's good call. Yeah. Foster's oh, yeah. good call. Oh, it's the... That's it, in an Australian accent. And, they, and they, they advertise a lot of the comedy, don't they? It always seems to stand around a lot of the comedy shows here in the UK. They seem to tag themselves along with that. They seem to want to promote having a good time, having a laugh. And it seems to be what they want to tie in with their beer. Well... What most of their adverts as well is, it's usually those two two fellas in a uh, beach shack. And, and I think as well, I remember them, they had a whole stream of them where uh, basically people were calling them up from the UK. So it was a person on the other end of the phone. They were Australian and they were like, hello. And then he was like, "Say, I'll stop doing the accent now, I promise. Please. And, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then, and then someone would like ask a question, you know, like, oh, is it all right if I have, I don't know, just something random. 
and they'd answer it in like a very funny way and then they'd hang up and go to Roo and then they put the phone down so it was like really hamming up because no, I, I bet no one in Australia actually says to Roo to say goodbye I was going to say also let's say you've broken your promise of not doing that accent again <laughs> yeah. you were literally 30 seconds yeah. and you were doing yeah I actually don't think I can keep to that promise if I'm honest it's too it's too natural right so I think we need to go back to why why this is an Australian in our minds an Australian beer but I, there's something in the back of my head which which makes me feel like it's not actually Australian or it's not well known in Australia so like starting us off like we know that you know I don't know if you guys found this out but Foster was actually created by two Irish Americans two brothers a guy called William M. and Ralph M. Foster. So they arrived from New York in Melbourne in 1886 and started brewing this Foster's Lager in 1888. So, so it was actually brewed in Australia to start with? Mm. So that's, it started off in Australia by these two brothers. Whether they were already making beer in New York and then they came to Australia, I couldn't figure that out. Yeah. But... If you actually look at its history and its heritage, mm. it is an Australian beer from Melbourne. Yeah. I mean, look at this This fact. This is so Australian in that, you know, the first product of, of it was exported in 1901 when bottles were sent to Australian combatants in the Boer War. So that's South Africa. Okay. You know, so this is like turn of the century, you know, very like helping the troops out. Like it sounds so very patriotic Australian, doesn't it? I've also, yeah. I've also got another, an- another interesting fact. So in 1889, Foster's won the prize of So this is a bit of a weird prize. The highest award against the world at the Melbourne Centennial Exhibition. That's the name of the award. The highest award against the world. I don't understand what that means. I'm not 100% sure what the award is for. Right. I I just feel like we need an Australian's opinion on this. Simo, can you get Jack Jack in? Is she around? Can you you ask her in? Hang on. Jack! What? Can you come in, please? Simo, you can't do that to her. That's horrible. <laughs> this has been a weird sneak peek into your home life. Yeah. Obviously, you've met Joe and Rich before. G'day, fellas. Hey, Jack. Thanks for coming in. We had a question because we're talking about Fosters and we just can't pinpoint whether or not Australians know about it because it's really just the Australian beer in our mind. But, I mean, what what do you think about it? Is it is it well known in Australia? Simple answer, no. Before I came over, I would not have known that it was an Aussie beer. Really? No. Nope. Is it is it sold in Australia? Do you know? Don't think so. So you, you've never seen it, never heard of it until you came to England. Correct. So if that's not an Australian beer, what do you would you call a Australian beer? Go to Aussie beers. You have Forex Gold, Victoria Bitter, Tui's New, Great Northern, Cooper's Carlton Draft. Oh, I've heard of Carlton. Carlton's like one of the, the the number one, or kind of like it's one of the, the it's been around for ages in Australia, right? Carlton beer. Yes, it has, uh, as well with Forex, which is 140 years old. So that's one of the big go-tos. Was was Forex the one that had all those really good adverts, the, the quite yes. c- comedic ones? The one- I yes. think I think it's I think it's the Castle Main Forex. It's like you wouldn't want a warm beer, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that would be it. Good Aussie accent there. Um, I, was like, I was like, Joe, mistake doing an Australian accent to an Aussie. <laughs> well, my, also, my Australian family are going to be like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I went to Australia, I thought that 4X was kind of known as what we think Foster's is in the UK, as in it's very accessible and it's eat like the big drinking beer. Yes, easy to drink, good for beer pong. <laughs> um, <laughs> Brewed in Brizzy, where I'm from. Yeah, it's a popular beer, lager, good to drink, hot day, which Queensland is known for its hot weather, so it's an easy to drink one. And I, I know that you've been talking to your bro- brothers and your dad about potential other like interesting, was it craft beers that we may not have heard of in the UK? Yes, so craft beers are pretty popular. Uh, our big ones that I know of and that friends of mine and stuff drink, uh, we've got Four Pines Brewing Company in Sydney. Apologies, fellas, about losing the first game of The Origin. Bolter Brewing. <laughs> James Squire. I'm guessing that was some Australian slam right there. And like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, boom, 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 Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get that one in so, there. So um, you need to explain the state of origin and what that is. All right, rugby league, head-to-head, New South Wales v Queensland, where I'm from. Three games. They've lost the first one. They'll lose the second and we'll win the third. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> you hear that? Yes. <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> stop it, Joe. You've got to stop doing the accent. Joe, seriously. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> That's awesome. So, apologies to my uh, New South Wales family. <laughs> <laughs> you can't buy alcohol in supermarkets in Australia. Well, in Queensland. Yeah, not in Queensland. And you, the store next to it is where you can buy it, basically, isn't it? Bottleos. <laughs> Bottleos. And <A> um, <laughs> bottle o. Bottle shop. Bottle shop. Oh, okay. You got to abbreviate everything. Oh yeah. What's some What's some other ab- ab- abbreviations? Uh, what else do we have? Afternoon is Arvo. <laughs> Garbage men is the Garbo. Garbo? Garbo. Garbo? Are you just adding O onto a lot of things at this yeah, point? It seems like yeah. it. It's, it yeah. works, so, though. Same with names as well. Simo is very, very Australian. Very Aussie. I think we were future-proofing you for your future move over there, Sim. Well, this has been a, an interesting insight into the Australian culture. <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, Jax, I don't want to take up more of your time, but goodbye, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, but we might introduce that one. <laughs> I think you start using it. Uh, you can have that one. That one's for free. I mean, that, that, one, one. that one takes longer than just saying goodbye. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, fellas. I hope uh, your rest of your beer chat goes well. It was well. just key insight. It was very helpful for, <laughs> yeah. for, what we're, for what we were trying to do with this, with Fosters. Thanks for uh, stepping in for us. So another interesting fact for Fosters is they obviously started in Melbourne and it was always really hot in, in when they started. And they wanted to keep it cool and help the bush the bushfires that are prevalent all around Australia. So they actually built the brothers built a six mile miles of pipeline to keep their lager chilled with seawater and they even set up their own fire brigade to protect the, their their brewery. Oh wow. Wow. So this is a this huge was, investment. So this was their brewery yeah. in Australia at the time. They set yeah, up Yeah, in Melbourne, yeah. And so they set up piping so they would keep their beer cooled with seawater. That is that's Yeah. I'm impressed. So I think it's also like to know how Austra- how Fosters is very integrated into Australia. You know, they actually f- merged in 1907 with the Carlton and United Breweries, which I think is a huge, huge brewery in Australia. Carlton is, I've heard of before. You know, so it was it was merged into part of it, and it only actually came to the UK in 1971. Yeah. Oh, so... so it's actually not that long, really, in the UK, but it's completely dominated the uk australian beer market if that makes any sense at all so so yeah so it's not been within england that long in in the, in the grand scheme of things compared to when it first started in australia i didn't realize this as well that it is the second highest selling beer in the uk and it's only beaten by carling but it's all around that kind of the price point isn't it they're quite for the alcohol level and for the lager and i think this is you know we were talking earlier on about um, that question from max about lager and why lager's got a bad rep in the uk and fosters and carling have sped the way for spearheaded the way of why us as uk consumers think of lager as being just a really cheap product because it's all about the the race to the bottom when it comes to price i was gonna say well do you guys know how many pints are sold a day in the uk of fosters no, ne- ne- nearly three million pints a day. Oh my god! Is, is oh, sold wow. and drunk, which is pretty impressive. As a beer, it was something that you would buy because, it, let's say, you were maybe a bit strapped on cash and you wanted, to, and you were going to a house party. You would buy it because it was always the cheapest crate, or it was always something that was like cheap, like I would say, cheap and cheerful kind of attitude towards it. It was never like, oh, I want that because I want to have a like a nice evening with it. It's, I want that because it will get me to my tipsy place. I haven't drunk it in years. And so for this pod, I had, I had a, a sip yesterday and it instantly transported me back to 2008, which wasn't the last time I drank it, I can tell you, but it was definitely the most memorable time. And it's like, Rich, you and I were in at Reading Festival, music festival. Fantastic festival. This is going to be a very bad story. <laughs> No, it's, it was, it's quite a clean story, actually, yeah. just because the morning of Reading Festival, where Rich and I got the train to Reading to go and get into the festival, I'd arrived back in the country that morning from a holiday in Greece, and I was just absolutely shattered, whereas everyone else, like you yourself, Rich, I remember, you were just all buzzing to be there. I was so excited to be there, because obviously, you know, we'd saved up and to, to go to this festival. You know, it's not, a, not cheap going to this to Reading Festival. 
And I just remember enjoying it so much, you know, during the day, we're listening to the acts, listening to comedy, you know, walking around, exploring it. But come like 10 o'clock at night, I was absolutely shattered. And I was just like, I need to go home and sleep. Whereas you guys were off having, you know, going to the the, the, the silent discos, you know, you're off kind of running around, like doing all this fun stuff. And then there's me being basically the old man in the group, just like, it's past my bedtime. I need to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I've had my one beer. It's bedtime. <laughs> It's like, where are my slippers, Jeeves? <laughs> what? Why, 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 why have I become like, a, I've got a butler now? Like, how's that? <laughs> Where's the butler appeared in this scenario? <laughs> but do, do all old men in your mind, Simo, do they have butlers <laughs> called Jeeves? Well, if they don't, they're missing out. And at what point have any of us in our lives, have any three of us ever had a butler in our household? Well, if any of us are going to do it, Joe is. <laughs> what? <laughs> How are you justifying that? So I think we, we briefly touched on the kind of the mergers in the, and where it's kind of in Australia. But importantly to note that they actually got massive when they got bought by SAB Miller. And that's where they got introduced into South Africa, a load of other kind of world country, uh, another load of other countries around the world. But obviously, as we know, from like 2019, 2016 time, that actually SAB Miller was went bankrupt. And so all the other breweries started buying up their other brands, their territories, their countries. And Foster's is no exception to that. So Foster's is now owned, as you can probably guess, by AB and Bev. Of course. Heineken International own the brand rights for the UK. Ah. So how does that work? Because that really confused me. So Joe, please do tell. <laughs> yeah, let me just... Uh, yeah, I mean, I was there consulting on this merger and acquisition, so I know all the ins and outs and details of it. I was in the boardroom. <laughs> And so what they've done is that they've had a deal with AB and Bev in that they can have they can own the products globally, but in specific markets, it's it's Heineken's to own and to mm-hmm. own the rights for for how their brand is is kind of perceived. And obviously, as we know, the UK is Foster's biggest market by a long way, isn't it? Can I can I can I just quickly point something out? Uh, What's that? I've drunk two of these pints in quite a small <laughs> period of time whilst recording this. I possibly might need to crack a third. And this is so so. As 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 with a lot of beers, I think, within the UK that are in the big commercial markets. So you take your Carlings, you take your Fosters, your Budweiser's and stuff. Big, big brands shop and drunk by a lot of people. As as we've discussed before, the taste isn't bad. The taste isn't there to be repulsive. It's there's a consistency to it. And with Fosters and with Carling and everything like that, especially with Fosters. There's a time and a place for a Foster's mm. sort of thing. Mm. Some, sometimes I, we really like our craft ales. We really like our craft beers. And we like some of these more exotic, these more fruity, these more hoppy flavours. But I don't want that all the time. I don't want... Sometimes I just want a Foster's sort of thing. I like the taste of it. I think it's pretty chill. It's not offensive. I'm not going to be drinking it all the time. And as we said, this is, I haven't drunk Foster's in absolutely ages sort of thing. It's nice. It is. It's craft. It says it on the can, craft to be refreshed. I feel refreshed after these two pints, and I'll probably have a third. And um... <laughs> John Drabwell, I've got a question for you. Far away. Are you are you thirsty, Drabwell? Yeah, that possibly down to me not drinking enough water today. Well, no, because it says on the I can. Mean... It says on the can that it's for the thirsty. So there you <laughs> there go. There we go. Yeah. I actually don't know how they can say that for the thirsty. It's an alcoholic beverage. There's so many strict laws around what you can and can't say when you're selling alcohol that that's quite interesting that they've got away with saying crafted to refresh. So we're thinking about, you know, if you're, thir- yeah, it's, it's all about thirst quenching, but actually it's a beer still. It's still got alcohol in it. So as you can imagine, so Foster's isn't brewed in Australia anymore. When, of course, there have been, before all of this, there have been a series of lawsuits against fosters because i believe on some of their old marketing and everything like that they claimed that a lot of it was brewed in australia and had all of these australian roots but there was a lot of brewing companies when it was overtaken by ab and bev a lot of lawsuits came against them which which they lost inevitably so they've had to change a lot of their advertising over time so they can so what they've got i'm assuming has been very strictly vetted by lawyers because they're they're trying not to be sued anymore so people were had an issue with them being the australian beer but not in australia yeah yeah, okay, yeah. which makes total sense. The Fosters have kept Melbourne on the can. Mm. So it's really, if you look on the can, it's at the top and it says Melbourne. They're, like, they're still being very proud of the fact that they're from Australia. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Knowing that it doesn't really have any presence in Australia or relevance for consumers in Australia anymore, it really is just, hey, the rest of the world, we're an Australian beer. 
yeah. in your market. What I did want to talk about, I, I quite like this. They've I've picked up the four pack because you can't buy Fosters in single cans anymore. And they got rid of those big 20 ounce, the huge cans. Do you ever see those ones, the big ones? Um, so we're drinking out of what, 440s, I think, milliliters. And they come in this four pack. And I know there's a, you know, the bit in keeping with this whole sustainability, getting rid of plast- plastic, re- reduction of plastic, they've got a plastic free beer holder, like can holder, where you'd put four into it. And yeah, it's really fascinating. It's made out of card. And you you can see little like kind of cut marks where the different cans would go into and then you can just pull them out quite easily. But yeah, I was really impressed with that. That's, you know, obviously this is a big company of Heineken and, and AB and Bev behind it. But yeah, I was thinking that was really interesting. One thing I'm just going to say now and add because I'm doing it right now is I've, I drank my first one, which was delightfully cold and therefore refreshing. However, my second one was not is kind of more room temperature. And now I am in a lot of dislike. Um, so you definitely have to have this fridged. Okay, so let's do uh, social media. So they've got 22k followers on Twitter, but their last post was on the 28th of January. Oh, wow. Which is very strange. As in like eight, nine months ago. Yeah. And then their followers on Instagram, 5.5k, and they are following one person. Let's have a look who they're following. Australia. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, that must be a joke. That's awful. That's amazing. Can't That's a really be. bad joke. That's a really bad one. <laughs> so yeah, we'll put the links in the description for their Instagram, Twitter, and Untapped to the website. Um, <laughs> I think we can all agree that Foster's is not Australian in any way, shape, or form is what probably constitutes being Australian. Yeah. Uh, an Australian beer nowadays. Uh, it's definitely not a go-to lager for if you're trying to have a nice tasting beer. No. But if you want to drink, be part of the three million pints a, a, a day and be part of the second highest selling beer in the UK market, then you'll grab a Foster's. And that's all we have time for from this week's episode of the I'll Try That podcast. And so from me, Joe, Rich and Simo, goodbye. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter and watch us on YouTube. Goodbye now. Always drink responsibly, and if you or anyone else needs some help, go to drinkaware.co.uk for more information.